Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our online service for Central Christian Church in Janesville. Uh, this is our service for September 27th. Um, my name is Kellen Anderson. I'm the campus pastor. Uh, if you've never joined us before, uh, we would love for you to come and join us in person uh, at the Pontiac Convention Center at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Um, I know that there's plenty of people out there uh, who you're still not comfortable with, with being somewhere in an cl- enclosed environment with other people right now. We get that. And so that's why we have our online service. But I want to make sure that you know that we are meeting in person. If you'd like to join us, we would love to have you join us. Um, what we're going to be doing today is uh, we're going to be uh, worshiping uh, with our Beloit worship band. And so in, a, in just a minute, we're going to be singing some songs. And then I'm going to be coming on and preaching from our Acts series in just a little bit. Uh, but also at the end of my sermon, we are going to take up uh, communion together. And we're going to remember uh, what Jesus did for us on the cross by eating uh, bread and drinking juice together. Uh, maybe you don't have bread. Maybe you just got crackers or something else that you can eat or maybe no juice. Maybe you get, just got some water. But go ahead and get those ready so we can take communion together and remember together what Jesus did on the cross for us. Uh, but we're going to go into uh, our first uh, song right now and just enter into worship and we invite you to enter into worship with us. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for your awesome goodness to us, your grace for us. And God, as we go into this time of worship right now, I know it's a little bit weird sometimes worshiping in our living room or in our car, uh, but God, I pray that this just could be a a moment where we really enter into your presence. Uh, We love you, Jesus. We thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing songs of praise to our King of Kings. Savior, I come, quiet my soul.
Give God the glory tonight. Amen. Hey everybody, this is The Loop. Uh, we want to let you know everything that is going on at our Central Janesville campus. Really, there's just a couple things that I want to make sure that you're aware of this morning. Uh, number one, a, a lot of you guys have probably heard um, that our state has had the, the mask mandate extended another 60 days. Um, just so that you're aware, we know that that, uh, there, that may go through a whole legal process and things like that. Uh, we want you to know that our elder board uh, met uh, last week, I believe it was, and they decided, even before that mask mandate came out, we're going to continue to ask you to be wearing masks when you come to church here, uh, at least for the next 30 days. And the, the elder board is going to kind of take a look at it every month and just kind of go on a month-to-month -month basis from this point forward. Um, the main thing is, is we want to do whatever we can, even in little and small ways, to make sure that we stay in a, safe enough that we can continue meeting together. Um, we don't want to have situations that, that we could have maybe had some hand in controlling um, where it allows us not to meet anymore in person. And so uh, we, we thank you so much for, as a church, you've been respecting uh, the, the mask mandate. And we, we just ask you to continue to do this little thing um, so that we can continue meeting together. And we really appreciate uh, how you guys have been about this. Uh, another thing that I want to let you know, uh, today we are taking up a special love offering uh, at Central Christian Church. And that love offering is going for a couple things. Um, uh, there's a, a church in Little Rock, Arkansas uh, that was firebombed earlier this year. And we want to help them rebuild. Uh, but we also want to be taking up uh, part of this love offering for a thing that we're calling Kids Works Unlimited, and that's at our Beloit campus. They're looking to, to redo their uh, their playground for kids so that kids with special needs can, can be a part of that. Um, and I just love that our church is always trying to find ways to serve whoever we can, especially serving kids with special needs and their families. And so just a couple great things to be given to with this love offering. Uh, if you want to give, uh, if you're doing this online, you can go uh, right on to centraljanesville.com and click on our online giving app or even in this room right now if you're with us in person. Um, but also in person here, you can go to the back of the room and we've got uh, offering buckets there and you can give there as well. Or you can go to our Give app. It's G-Y-V-E and you can, you can sign up on there and you can give to Central Janesville on the Give app. Uh, so that's just a couple things that we want to make sure that you knew about this week. Um, we thank you so much for being with us and being a part of this. Uh, let's get into the message now. This has been The Loop and now you're in it. Do you guys ever have conversations that just go the wrong way right from the start? Um, what's your favorite one? The, the one where you're talking to the teenage girl and you say what you think will just be a friendly joke and she runs off crying like you killed her cat or something? Yeah, I've, I've done that one. And people look at you like you actually did kill her cat or something. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, or how about the one where you're talking with your boss and they say, I think something needs to change or we might have to end up going another way. Yeah, that one's not much fun either. And I've been there on that one too. Um, or there's the one with, you're with your kids and it's that one where you know someone else is probably hearing but you can't stop your kid from saying what's about to come out. And I, I had a memory come up on my Facebook account uh, this week and it was from three years ago. Finley was about three years old at the time and we were, we were at Kohl's, we were doing some shopping and she had to go to the bathroom. And so we're walking through the store to go to the restrooms and we walk by the ladies section and she says, she, she points, she's like, daddy, big bras. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, honey, you're right. Um, you know, it's not too big of a deal, right? But then it's like it triggered something in her mind and all of a sudden she starts singing the first line to the song i like big butts and i cannot lie uh, no lie i'm like girl where'd you learn that like you gotta stop it or i'm gonna get arrested for bad parenting if someone hears you singing that um conversations they can definitely have a tendency to go in places that are rather unexpected they can go in places that we wish that they would never have gone but sometimes they never go in the places that they actually should go. 
And today we're going to take a look at Acts chapter 11 in our fourth message in this Acts in series, in the series in Acts. And the Apostle Peter takes a conversation with a close friend to places that it needed to go. This series has been a study on purpose, uh, living life on purpose. We've talked about knowing your history, knowing God's word, so that you can understand truth enough to actually live on purpose. Uh, We've talked about admitting that you might be wrong about some things in life. The purpose of living with humility. We've talked last week about the purpose of choosing grace for others like Jesus has for us rather than dehumanizing people with prejudiced thoughts. But I'm excited today for what we're going to look at at this conversation that Peter had with really a group of friends of his. And I think it's going to give us some great purpose for where some of our most important conversations in life need to be directed. And let me take a minute to just kind of give you a quick review on what we studied last week because it's really going to be essential to understanding what we're talking about this week. And so last week in Acts chapter 10, We looked at a story where uh, there was this Roman soldier named Cornelius and he had a dream in which he was visited by an angel who told him to send for a man named Peter. And he was told that he needed to listen to what Peter had to say. And so while these men that he sent to go get Peter were on their way to find him, Peter also had a vision. And God showed him a, a bunch of animals that were considered by Jewish law to be unclean. And God told him he needed to kill and eat one of those animals. But Peter couldn't believe what he was being asked to do. And he he was appalled at God. And he's like, surely, Lord, I'm not going to do that. Surely not, Lord. God was saying, Peter, don't tell me no when I say to do something. These animals are clean. And so God did all this to show Peter that none of those animals were actually unclean. And he did that to show Peter that the Gentile people that he had treated as animals and who he thought were unclean, that even those people, those Gentiles, were also not unclean. And Peter then goes to Cornelius' house without hesitating. They listen to what he has to say about being saved through Jesus, and they all get saved. But when we come to Acts chapter 11, Peter now has gone home. And you've got to be thinking that Peter's probably on this a bit of a high, at least spiritually speaking. His heart was just changed in regard to how he thinks about Gentiles, And this whole household of Romans were just saved through their belief in Jesus. Peter's got to be feeling good. But when he gets home, he's met with this concern that catches him probably a bit off guard. And a difficult conversation ensues with a group of friends that are really close to him. And here's how it goes. Acts 11 verses 1 through 4 says, The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of Cornelius, uh, into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. Now, I don't want to retell this whole story because that's what he does here. It's what we went over last week. So I'm not going to read it all. But do you feel the tension here in the reaction of Peter's friends to what what? Peter had done. These are believing Jews, Christian Jews, and they're criticizing Peter. And for what? For going into the home of non-Jews and eating with them. They had heard that Peter preached the gospel to these people, and they weren't too happy about it. Now, what in the world would make them so on edge about this? Shouldn't it be a good thing that more people had received the good news about Jesus? But instead of being happy about it, they've cornered Peter. And you can just about hear it, can't you? These people are like, you went and hung out with Gentiles? You ate with Gentiles? You stayed in the home of Gentiles? Like, what has gotten into you, Peter? What were you thinking doing that? Last week, we talked about not prejudging people. So before we judge these Christian friends of Peter's, let's think about maybe the situation that they were, the way that they were looking at it. Uh, There was already much to fear for the Jewish people in the city of Jerusalem who believed in Jesus. Uh, It was already seen by those in authority that these Jewish Christians were too liberal on their views about generally accepted tenets of the Jewish faith. They weren't quite as up for following the customs and laws that most Jews followed. They believed that Jesus was the final sacrifice and no other sacrifices for sin were ever going to need to be made. 
And really, all this had led in part to the execution of Stephen that we, that we talked about a few weeks back and to believers being expelled from areas where there were, the, the control was in, in the control of the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of the Jewish people. So as might be expected, these believers who were close with Peter, they were pretty concerned when they heard that he was going out and hanging out with, with people and eating with people who were Gentiles. They would have seen this as an act that could maybe really quickly dissipate any goodwill that still remained between the Sanhedrin, these religious leaders, and the group of Jewish believers themselves. This was really very, very realistically, this was potentially a deadly situation for this group of people. Uh, This group of people that were confronting Peter, they were in an unusual situation. They were essentially trying to live out two, two separate religions almost. There was the Christian set of beliefs that they had that Jesus died for them, that he was their access to God. But then they also were entrenched in all this Jewish custom that they had grown up with. It was part of their social fabric, uh, if not also part of their religious identity as well. But their Jewish customs also tied them to the, to, directly to their nation. We're really talking about an identity that these Jewish Christians were terrified of just throwing away. If it went too far, they might be seen by people that they'd considered close family and, and part of their nation. as They'd be considered as unpatriotic. They'd, they would be seen as not true to their nation. And, and likely, more than just being cut off as citizens, they would be likely to be killed for that stuff. So yes, there, there was some fear that Peter's friends had. And let's be fair to them. It was a legitimate fear. But Peter didn't just give in to them. As we read in verse 4, Peter it says that Peter started from the beginning and he told them the whole story. He told them all about God showing him that the animals that he thought were unclean weren't really unclean, just like the Gentiles also were not unclean. And as he spoke to these Gentiles, they chose to believe in Jesus for salvation and for eternal redemption. And so he finished his conversation with his friends like this. Acts 11, verse 15, it says, he says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on these people as as he had come on us at the beginning. And then I remember what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, Who is I to think that I could stand in God's way? And when they heard this, they had no further objections. And they praised God saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Peter had a courageous conversation with his family members, with friends, people who looked like him. And sometimes those can be the hardest people for us to be real with. We don't want to rock the boat always with people that... We, we most want to actually have like us. But Peter was willing to have that, that hard conversation, making sure that these, these friends of his understood that Jesus convicted him of every wrong thought process that was going on with him, that he would no longer judge or prejudge people based on their differences. See, Peter was willing to take this difficult conversation and to point it to the gospel. And that's exactly what I think you and I need to be willing to do every single day. We need to be willing to have conversations that point to the gospel. And so maybe you're asking, okay, hey, Kevin, what what in the world would it look like to point a conversation to the gospel? And let's answer that a little bit by looking at what Peter did in this story. What is it that Peter did to point this difficult conversation to the gospel? What did he do to point it to the good news about Jesus? First thing he did was this. Uh, Peter told them the whole story. It says, again, Acts chapter 11, verse 4, starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. You know, his friends were coming at him and they were kind of, they were coming at him hard. They wanted to know how he could do what he did. And he didn't shy away from it. He didn't tell them a half truth. He didn't tell them just enough to get them off his back. In a difficult conversation, that's really easy for us to do. But you see, he... You can't get the gospel with only half-truths. The gospel, the good news about Jesus, it requires full truth-telling because it is truth. 
Now, I think at times where friends would, would come and ask me why I didn't go to a party or why, why maybe I don't do some of the kinds of things that they do. And taking that conversation to the gospel, it requires a, a really hard, full truth. You know, well, be, I don't do the stuff you do because I love Jesus and I'm grateful for what he did for me. And so I, I want to I wanna do my best to please him. But no, that's, that's too much for me a lot of the time. So I, I, a lot of times in my life, I'd, I'd half truth it. And it'd be like, nah, you, I just don't want to get in trouble like you guys. That's why I don't do what you do. But you see that there's, there's no gospel there. Another thing that the whole truth did for Peter was it kept him from having to get defensive. Um, now, I don't know about you, but that's not something that I'm very good at, not getting defensive. If, if my wife says something to me like, you know, Kellen, you shouldn't have said that. Um, I usually get defensive. And I'm like, no, well, they shouldn't have gotten stupid in the first place. You know, I've always got some retort, but where's the gospel in that? The gospel's nowhere there. When I can say, yeah, you know what? You're right. I was wrong. I need to ask for forgiveness. I messed up and I need some grace. That's the story of the gospel. When we point our mind and our heart to gospel principles, we don't have to get defensive anymore. When the gospel is at the center of your reasoning, you don't have to get defensive. If you did what you did and you believe what you believe because it lines up with God's heart of grace for, for the world around you, you're never going to have to get defensive. When you live in light of the whole truth of Jesus, you don't have to get defensive because you know you've been forgiven. You know that you're loved. You know that God's on your side. Even if the whole world uh, around you just, it just goes against you. You don't have to get defensive. The second thing that Peter did in this conversation to bring it to the gospel was this. He emphasized that knowing and receiving Jesus matters more than anything else. That's really what Peter's friends were struggling with. Uh, something else mattered to them more than the Gentiles receiving Jesus mattered. They didn't want their social status or their safety boat to be rocked. Acts eleven seventeen says, So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? Part of this whole truth that Peter was relaying to his friends and how he was taking this conversation to the center of the gospel was the powerful way that Peter explained that he had been all wrong about the Gentiles before. He's realized that he can't stand in the way of God. Jesus has to be at the center of everything and should become the center of every person. And this really is a culmination of the things that we've been talking about these past few weeks. It's about admitting that we're, sometimes we're wrong. It's about choosing grace over judgment. What happened when Peter stepped out and brought the gospel to the forefront of his friend's concerns? His friend's fears dissolved as what was most important finally came to light. Bottom line is this, the gospel changes everything. Even as the gospel changes everything, though, our tendency is to want to be comfortable at the expense of bringing the gospel to light and making Jesus known. We, we struggle to talk up the truths of Jesus because it makes us uncomfortable. It makes others uncomfortable. Maybe it even feels weird to us sometimes. But the gospel is not a story of comfort. The good news of Jesus is that he gave up his comfort for our good. The gospel is a story that, that's worth us giving up our comfort for the good of others. Here's ultimately what Peter did in this in, in interaction with this group of people that he was close to. He pointed them to the real story, to the story that matters most. He pointed them to the gospel. And I talk quite a bit about preaching the gospel to yourself. Uh, it's this idea of reminding yourself in any given situation Reminding yourself of what matters more, most, that the story of the good news of Jesus Christ, what Jesus has done for you, it should outweigh every other thought in your mind. And in today's passage, the gospel wasn't heavy on the minds of Peter's friends. They weren't thinking about God's desire for everyone to be reconciled to him when they questioned Peter's interactions with Cornelius' household. They were concerned with how Peter's actions were were going to affect their own standing with the Jewish society around them. Uh, their hearts and minds needed to be redirected to what actually mattered. And I think that there's probably at least one moment every single day where we need to be reminded of the gospel. Uh, 
It may be in a moment where we're thinking like Peter's friends. We're worried about how people around us are going to perceive us more than we're concerned about how someone else might perceive God's love for us uh, or God's love for them. Uh, uh, Or our kids are more worried about losing a friend than they are concerned about with this reminder that the greatest friendship that they could ever have is a friendship with Jesus. Uh, More than trying to give you points from this passage of Acts, trying to tell you all the ways that I, I think you can be best aim your conversations back to the gospel, I want to throw out a couple of real life scenarios that maybe you could see coming up in your life and let that paint a picture for you of how you can bring the gospel forward in those kinds of moments. Um, learning to see the world in light of the good news of Jesus is something that really you have to train yourself in. You have to train yourself to pick out the ungospel way of thinking, and you've got to replace it with a gospel way of thinking. Uh, and that's really what Peter was doing here with his friends. They had an ungospel thought that Cornelius and his Gentile friends weren't worthy of Peter's kindness. And Peter meant to instill in them an understand, and, to, and to understand really a gospel thought that Cornelius and the Gentile friends were deeply loved by God. And not only did they need to hear Jesus' love, they needed that good news. And so here's some scenarios, just a few of them, that I think you might come up in today's life um, where you have to be able to, to take a conversation and lead it to gospel thinking. Um, lead someone to thinking life through the good news of Jesus. And so here's the first scenario. Uh, let's say your kid thinks that they won't, won't have status with their friends if they can't have the things that their friends have. Um, maybe they, they want a certain social media account or a, a certain kind of phone or a lack of a curfew like their other friends have or they want more freedom with a boyfriend or a girlfriend, whatever it might be. Uh, frankly, your child needs to have that conversation flipped. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, they do not want to hear anything that doesn't appease their immediate needs in life. But this conversation needs to get flipped. Uh, you have to redirect their thinking to a gospel-centered way of thinking. And if you don't do it, you'll never, they'll, they'll never think through a Jesus-centered point of view. They'll never think through life with Jesus at the center. They won't see the world as it's meant to be seen by God. The only thing that really matters is your child's status as a child of God. If his or her identity is not found there, they're never going to be happy, no matter what amount of status they find elsewhere. Now, is that something they want to hear right now? Maybe not. (laughs) But you can either tell them truth that they need to hear in hopes that it'll sink in over time, or you can ignore truth that they need to hear and hope that it'll magically just be learned in their head some, somehow, even though it was never taught. Have the meaningful conversation that leads to growth as you bring it back to the gospel. As you tell your child that you won't give in to this thing that they want, that they think will make them liked, remind them that the only place where they're ever going to find perfect love is in the, perf- is in the person of Jesus. It's the only place. Status found anywhere else is never going to make them content, and they're only going to have to look for it somewhere else at another time. Ah, That status is, they're they're just never going to be content if their status isn't found in Jesus. But I want you to be warned about something. It might seem like it's super spiritual or even overly cheesy to talk in gospel-centered ways with the people that you love most. Kill that feeling in yourself as soon as you can. Ask yourself this. What's more important than having a healthy understanding of who Jesus is and what that means for my life? And the answer is there's nothing that's more important. Make it a commonplace in your conversations with your kids, with your spouse, uh, with your best friends, that you remind each other of the most important, most gospel-centered thoughts that, that there are. You know, thoughts like being content in Jesus' love for you. It's essential to true contentment. Any other contentment that you find, it's bound to be broken over time. Speak that out. Don't buy into the lie that it's too spiritual to talk like this. If you never broach the subject of your kids' spiritual lives with them, they aren't going to have a spiritual life. They won't know that the gospel uh, matters more than their friendship matters. 
you need to talk about Jesus with your kids. They won't just pick it up by osmosis. In fact, you might, you might actually do more harm if you're not talking about Jesus with them on a day-to-day basis. And this goes for your friends too. I want, you, I want you to listen to this story. There's a story about a man who became a Christian during an evangelistic emphasis that took place in a city in the, the Pacific Northwest. And when the man told his boss about this this conversion experience, his employer responded, man, that's great. I'm I'm a Christian. I've been praying for you for years. But the new believer just couldn't understand it. He's like, why why didn't you ever tell me that you were a Christian? You were the very reason I I wasn't interested in the gospel all these years. And the boss was like, how can that be? I've done my very best to live the Christian life around you. And that employee said, that's the point. You lived such a model life without telling me it was Jesus who made the difference. I convinced myself that I could live such a life, such a good and happy life without Jesus because you were able to do it. (laughs) If you're not talking about how uh, centered around Jesus you are um, with the people that you love most, if you're not bringing conversations back to a gospel centeredness, might they be thinking that Jesus isn't essential to how you're getting by in life? Everything has to start from Jesus and work its way down from there. If I'm content in my status with Jesus as someone loved by God enough that he sacrificed himself for me, then I don't need other things to make me content. But if I'm starting from someplace else, all other places are imperfect. I'll only receive imperfect love from other places and other people. And so I'm going to continue to need to search for more and more, and I'm never going to be content. The gospel that your kids and and your friends need to hear and know is that in Jesus, they gain acceptance. They don't need it anywhere else, so they can stop looking for it everywhere else. And let me say this one more thing about that. If your kids or your loved ones see that you have bought into this good news, that you're content in the love of Jesus and you aren't looking for it anyplace else, that'll do more than anything else to prove to them that this gospel idea that you're talking about is right. All right, so uh, here's a second scenario um, where you may be able to take a conversation to the point of pointing it to the gospel. You got this conversation around the Thanksgiving table that leads to various family members harping on the absolute incivility and depravity of one group of people in society. Now, this one's an easy one to join in, (laughs) and it feels good to join in. Why? Because it goes back to dehumanizing others. Like we talked about last week, Peter was comfortable dehumanizing non-Jews, those Gentiles. And as he did so, it let him feel as if he was on this higher plane nearer to God than those other uncivilized Gentiles. And so it comes to this. As I dehumanize one person, I look and feel better as the more human person, as the morally superior person. But the gospel, the truth about the good news of Jesus, always reminds me that it's my incivility and depravity that led Jesus to the cross. Bringing up this truth in a conversation that's spiraling downward into pointing out other people's awfulness, pointing out the the truth of our own depravity can quickly shut down the line of this conversation. Just like Peter's explanation of the gospel outlook on Cornelius' household shut down Peter's friend's arguments about those awful Gentiles. And and again, it might sound way too spiritual in your ears, like it's this super spiritual thing to talk about. Maybe you need to pass it off almost like it's a joke. Um, You know, I I know I've gone that route before when when I needed to kind of bring things back to a gospel centeredness. Um, But even joking can can still be effective. Everyone's bashing some type of person and essentially dehumanizing that other group of people. And maybe you say something like, man, I'm, I'm sure glad that I didn't need Jesus to come and die on a cross for me. I'm glad, that, I'm glad it's only those other people that need it over there. Like, I know it sounds silly, but it's just that little, little bit of, uh, of a comment that if you say it in the right loving manner, it kind of brings everybody back to their senses and, and, and realize yeah, you know what? We are talking about people that need Jesus. It brings you back to this gospel centeredness. Are you willing to take a conversation that is void of the gospel and bring it back to this gospel mindset where we see our supposed enemies as people in need of Jesus? Now, 
I know that this is, this is a hard ask, but doesn't that sound like quite the challenge for your Thanksgiving Day political dialogues with your family? What would it look like for us to have a courageous conversation, not on social media, not with people who are, we're looking to get to know who are different than us that we don't really know, but to have a courageous conversation with the people that we're most familiar with? People similar to us who maybe have mindsets and mentalities about different people or races or ethnicities or socioeconomic classes, but maybe those mindsets don't fit in a gospel-centered narrative. Every day, I believe that you and I have to be willing to preach the gospel to someone. Now, let's be honest. Usually, it's, it's ourselves, first and foremost, that we need to preach the gospel to, but uh, we have to constantly be reminding ourselves of what the truth of the gospel means for the way that I'm thinking about myself and the way that I'm thinking about the people around me. But sometimes it also means I have to preach the gospel in love within a difficult conversation with somebody that I love. <laughs> Are you doing that on a regular basis? Are you ready and willing to do that? Do you need to see how the good news of Jesus impacts every thought and every conversation that you have so that you can actually point people to the gospel in everyday circumstances. Uh, My prayer for you today is that you'd begin to engage with those around you in a more gospel-centered focus. Uh, My prayer is that we would each start pointing the people around us to the grace of Jesus in every one of these everyday types of scenarios and conversations that we come across this week. Why don't you pray with me? Lord, I thank you so much that you allow us to have conversations with people uh, where we can have opportunities to point people to the gospel, where we can point people to the good news of Jesus. God, I thank you for the courage that Peter showed uh, when it came to his conversation with his friends who were questioning him why he would speak to the Gentiles even. And God, he stood up for the gospel. He stood up for the fact that those Gentiles needed Jesus too. God, in everyday situations, we come across moments where we can bring the gospel to light. God, sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we miss it. God, I pray that you would open our minds to see those moments, whether it's with our kids, with our spouses, with our friends at work, uh, with people that we go on a workout with, go for a jog with, whatever it might be. God, I pray that you would open up our minds to understanding and seeing those moments where we can bring the gospel to light. Help us to do this, Lord, and and help us to do it in our own lives, to preach the gospel to ourselves, to remind remind ourselves of those gospel truths that we need to see and hear every single day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, What we're going to do right now is we go into one last song. Let's take a moment to remember Jesus by taking communion together. Everything points back to what Jesus did on the cross for us. Everything. And we need to do everything we can to point everything in our lives back to the cross. And I don't think there's a a more specific moment than taking communion together where we point our minds and our hearts to the cross again. And what's awesome about the cross is that Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose out of that grave three days later. We know we have victory over everything that we deal with in this life, every sin, every struggle. But we know that there's victory over death, that we will be with Jesus for eternity because of his sacrifice coming to this world for us, dying on a cross. Why don't we just take a moment and remember what he did for us. Jesus, again, we thank you so much for your body and your blood given up for us, your blood shed for us. Lord, we're grateful that you would be our sacrifice. Uh, Everything points back to the cross. That is the, the greatest moment in the history of this world where you died for our sake where you died to forgive us of our sins. God, we we give you ourselves right now. Forgive us, cleanse our hearts of that sin that, that, that still is in there. God, help us to be more like you today. And every day this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. church to sing even now even I could see darkness is fading the walls of fear brick by brick will come down your light will shine lift 
shout my way up to the mount I will take hold of the truth that you promised I'm gonna praise, I'm gonna praise And I'm gonna push through till every light crumbles I'm gonna dance in the midst of the rain And I'm gonna rest in the arms of the Father I'm gonna praise, I'm gonna praise your name Give God praise tonight Hey, thanks everybody for being a part of our online service once again this weekend. Uh, we just want to continue to encourage you right now. I love this, uh, this book of Acts that we're going through and these messages that, that have uh, been challenging for me. I hope they've been half as challenging for you as they have been for me. But let's be thinking about those conversations that God is putting in our lives that he wants us to take to that place of uh, bringing the gospel into that conversation whether it's with your kids or with your, your best friend or with your spouse or, or with people at work even. Um, what are some ways that you, we can bring the gospel into these conversations and help people to see the grace of Jesus through our everyday scenarios of life? Um, let me pray for you as we go into our week and, and let's pray that God will do this work in us and show us those moments. Lord, thank you again for this morning. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. And God, I pray that you will encourage us and give us uh, the, the understanding and, and the wherewithal to see those moments that you put in our lives to bring conversations to a place where we bring the gospel into it, where we show, just shine the light of Jesus and the, and the good news about Jesus into our everyday lives and into the lives of the people around us. God, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Hope you have a great week. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks.